Hi everyone, this is a video to replace your practical experience that you would have had with me on spirometry. Um, so with spirometry, we're measuring this thing, V. So we're measuring ventilation. Now, it's important to remember that with ventilation, whether it's a room or a building or a person, you can measure it. Okay, and it's measured basically as the flow of air in liters per minute through that room or building or person. So when you breathe, normally you're breathing somewhere in the region of about 12 breaths a minute. And each of those breaths that you take is about half a liter. So you breathe half a liter in, half a liter out, half a liter in, half a liter out. So the volume of air passing into the lungs per minute is therefore six liters per minute. That is called minute ventilation. So because we're measuring rate of change or something, when we talk about ventilation and we measure it, we put a little dot on the top of it. It shows that it's a rate. So what we were just talking about, the volume you breathe in and out, half a liter, that goes in, half a liter goes out, that is called your tidal volume, and that's represented by VT. So, see that little T there, and that's just always a subscript. So you've got the V with a dot on it, and you've got the T, which is subscript. That's your tidal volume. Now, the problem with tidal volume is that the net change of flow over a cycle because you breathe in half a liter in, half a liter out, half a liter in, half a liter out. You're oscillating around the same point. So the net change in ventilation is zero, which means that that maddeningly unhelpful way of measuring changes in breathing um, gets replaced by something else, which is VE, which stands for rate of change of volume expired. And then there's a, a whole host of different VEs <coughs> excuse me, that we can look at. So just looking at this um, this diagram, I suppose, it shows a very, very, very old version of a spirometer. And that's this, that's this bit here. Uh, and the very, very old version of a spirometer is called a bell and counterweight spirometer. So what you end up, what you get, no, no, what you end up with, what you get is um, a column of water with an inverted with a, uh, another inverted column on it and it looks so it's got this bell shape and then you as a as a as a patient or a subject will breathe into and out of the air space between the bell and the water so as you take a breath in it causes the bell to sink and as it causes the bell to sink the counterweight will pull this belt, this pen up on a graph paper and that's a very, very simple way of doing it. Um, so if we look at some areas, so you take a breath in and out, in and out. So I'm just looking out, in, out, in, out. So that means that this volume that is shown here is your tidal volume, which is VT we talked about earlier. In, tidal volume in, tidal volume out. Tidal volume in, tidal volume out. Tidal volume in, tidal volume out. So what we've asked this participant to do is tidal volume in, out, in, out, in, breathe out to a normal out breath, and then take a big deep breath in, fill your lungs, and then blow out hard and as fast as you can, until you empty your lungs and then go back to normal breathing. So that's what you're looking at on screen. So from at the end of a normal quiet expiration, you've got some air left in your lungs that you can access. And that is called your ERV, which stands for expiratory reserve volume. And you've got some air in your lungs that you cannot access, which is your residual volume or residual lung volume, which is sometimes called RLV. 
when you add volumes together, so if you take your expiratory reserve volume and add it to your residual lung volume, you get a capacity. So two volumes added together usually gives you a capacity. So this is your FRC, which stands for functional residual capacity. So that is at the end of a normal quiet expiration, what air is left in your lungs? So your, in other words, your functional residual capacity. I'm not forgetting that that doesn't include your tidal volume. So same thing, but on inspiration. So in other words, from a tidal out breath to the most that you can fill your lungs, that is your functional inspiratory volume. Now you notice that it's not a capacity and it's not a capacity because we're not adding two volumes together. We're simply taking into account the tidal volume when we say from a, from the, the beginning of your functional residual capacity, what is the maximum amount that we can take in? And that is one single volume. So you've got your functional residual capacity and your functional inspiratory volume. Again, this does include your tidal volume. So, in, out, in, out, in, out. Big deep breath in, breathe in to functional inspiratory volume, and then out to your expiratory reserve volume. That will be what we would call a forced expiratory volume. So, we can look at the forced expiratory volume in one second. So, in other words, how much of your um, your vital capacity, so which is another another one that we need to add you to. So just give me a second. Um, this is your residual volume, which I've already talked about as part of your functional residual capacity. Your vital capacity is the sum of your expiratory reserve volume and your functional inspiratory volume. So in other words, how much air can you access completely from breathing in as deeply as you can to breathing out as deeply as you can? That's your vital capacity. Now, if you do this in what's called a forced maneuver, like we've asked your participant to do here. So in other words, blow big deep breath in, then blow out hard and as fast and as long as you can until you physically can't breathe any more out. That becomes not your VC, but your F. VC. And that, and, that, and that doesn't stand for functional vital capacity. It stands for forced vital capacity. And when you perform that maneuver, if we look at the amount of your vital capacity that you can get out in one second, that is called your FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second. So the vital capacity is how much air do you have access to? And the forced expiratory volume in one second tells us something about your vital capacity that we will get to in a minute. Right, so these are the things that I would expect you to remember. I would expect you to remember what FRC is and how to define it. I would expect you to, remem to remember what your residual lung volume is. I want you to know what your vital capacity is, what your force vital capacity is, and how we measure it. I want you to know what your FEV1 is, why it's important, and how we measure it. I want you to know what your um, your functional inspiratory volume is, and I want you to understand why the vital capacity in one second, forced expiratory volume in one second, is important. Now, you, we can measure pretty much everything on this graph with the exception of your residual lung volume. It is very, very difficult to measure that and it's impossible to do it with spirometry. We can get an estimation of it using spirometry, but we can't do a good measurement of it using spirometry. So let's look at how we do actually measure the residual volume and your uh, functional residual capacity as a result. So the first one that we can look at is helium dilution. So, um, Looking at it on screen here, what it says is a helium, di a helium reservoir, which is usually 
um, what's called a gas collection bag, otherwise known as a Douglas bag. So a Douglas bag, that's with a capital D because it's named after a person. So we would fill a Douglas bag with a predetermined concentration of helium. And then you as the patient would breathe through a three-way, what's called stopcock valve, otherwise otherwise known as a, a non-rebreathing valve. So in other words, it will allow air from, from the bag into your lungs. And you'll notice then that this stopcock is turned off. This stopcock is turned on. So air would come out of the bag into you and then breathe out into this other bag. So helium is going in and then a gas mixture of air and helium is coming out. And it says when, so at your functional residual capacity, the stopcock is turned and you breathe the helium air mixture and concentration levels off. And then using um, the law of partial pressures and volumes, we can figure out the initial amount of helium must equal the final amount, otherwise known as the concentration of helium initially multiplied by the residual volume equals the final concentration of helium multiplied by the residual volume plus the functional residual capacity. And then we can, um, we can um, rearrange that equation to solve for the functional residual capacity. Now, I'm not going to test you on this, um, but I just want you to have a decent understanding of the fact that this works um, and therefore why it works as well. Another way that we can do it is with, with, is with oxygen rebreathing, which you may see um, called nitrogen washout. Um, and basically with this one, you breathe out to your residual volume rather than to your functional residual capacity and then breathe in and out um, from a Douglas bag containing a known volume of oxygen. Then you take a big deep breath in and then you breathe out again to residual volume into another bag. And the air in the bags, uh, the air in the residual volume is approximately 80% nitrogen. The dilution of this by the known volume of pure oxygen will allow us to calculate the residual volume. So whatever we're doing, you can see that we're basically taking into account a similar kind of equation to give us an idea of what that functional residual capacity or residual lung volume is. Now, it is probably worth uh, mentioning that you can get a, a pretty decent idea of what somebody's residual lung volume is um, from spirometry, um, but it is only an estimation. And the equation that we would use is your force vital capacity multiplied by 0.25 for males or 0.24 for females will give you residual lung volume as, as, a, as an estimate. Both of those are significantly, either of the, these measures, um, oxygen rebreathing, nitrogen washout or helium dilution are significantly more challenging to do than a bit of spirometry. Um, always worth remembering the different things that are going to affect your lung volumes, body size, um, all lung volumes are larger in larger people. All volumes are smaller in children and smaller in old age. Um, men, by and large, have greater lung volumes than women. Muscle training will increase all volumes. And I mean inspiratory and expiratory muscle training, not, not weight training. Um, and the changes that we see in lung volumes in disease are actually used to diagnose what these diseases are. So... Um, a modern spirogram will not look like uh, the, the spirograms we looked at on this slide, where we take a big deep breath in and then out. We actually tend to flip this graph on its head, um, and a modern spirogram will look like this. So the patient takes a big breath in, they put their mouth around the spirometer, and then blow out hard and as fast and as long as they can. So this is usually taken from one second up to somewhere in the region of about six seconds where this tends to level off and then time increasing this way. Usually though, um, 
we would we would take this graph and we would ask a patient to blow out and if they cannot maintain six seconds um then the test isn't complete as far as we're concerned so let's just look at it like this so the patient go, takes a big deep breath in puts his mouth around a sperm and just blows out as hard and as fast as they as they can hard and as fast and as long as they can so it's a big deep breath in and then <sighs> breathe out as much as you can until you can't breathe anymore and then it'll tail off so we can read from this and it is called a volume time graph a couple of things so your flow will be volume divided by time volume over time so what this means to us is and you can see here there's a dotted line on this graph any way that we take on this curve if you take the um the steepness of the curve at any point you will get flow at that point so the slope of the curve the steepness slope the slope of the curve steepness jesus uh the slope of the curve will at any point in this graph give us an i give us um not an idea but an actual calculation of what the flow is so if we want to know the peak expiratory flow rate or peak expiratory flow or peak flow rate you, you see all all different versions of these acronyms used so this 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 graph has decided to put all four letters in so pef peak expiratory flow you find the steepest part of the curve and then you take flow is volume over time so the slope of the curve is flow and therefore the peak flow pfr or pef is the maximum slope so the slope is the change in the y-axis over the change in the x-axis at any given time so you remember what you would have been doing in maths you take you, you come down you take the change in the y-axis over the change in the x-axis and that'll give you the flow the other way of course you can do it is that you could say that you find the angle at that point and the cause of the angle will give you the peak flow so in terms of the the other measures that we need to look at for any spirogram we need to know these are the three key measures we need to know the vital capacity the peak expiratory flow and the forced expiratory volume in one second for modern spirometry these three things are the key you can take your force flight capacity divided by 0.25 for males, 0.24 for women, and it'll give you an idea of what the residual lung volume is. You can also take the FEV1 and divide it by the force flight capacity and find a ratio of one to the other. And this is actually a diagnostic test for obstructive lung conditions. So the force flight capacity is the highest volume that we get. And you basically just read it off the graph on the y-axis. It doesn't matter when you reach vital capacity so the the point at which the x-axis reaches the vital capacity is not important what is important is what the vital capacity is and you read that off and you read it off in liters the forced expiratory volume in one second is the point at which the curve crosses the one second mark on the x-axis and then you read that off in liters so then the fev1 divided by the FBC gives us this other thing called the FER otherwise known as the forced expiratory ratio a normal value for this is 75% or 85% so in other words you should be able to clear at least 75% of your vital capacity in one second if you are below 0.75 you have and definitely below 0.7 it is a differential diagnosis for OLD, which stands for obstructive lung disease. Now, this is a volume time graph. A more popular way these days of showing a spirogram is on a flow volume loop rather than a volume time graph. So we're plotting now instead of volume on the Y axis, we're plotting flow. And instead of time on the X axis, we're plotting volume so what you will notice on this one is that um volume is in reverse so don't get caught up with this you will notice is a zero here this is a zero on the y-axis not a zero on the x-axis the zero on the x-axis is here 
okay? So again, just think about it like this, right? Okay, we ask the patient to take a big deep breath in and then blow, put their mouth around the spir spirometer and blow out hard and as fast and as long as they can. So quick blow. And look, this is the highest rate at which the air is leaving that person's lips. So there is no complicated slope to try and work out for peak expiratory flow. Peak expiratory flow is simply read off the y-axis because this is flow in liters per second. So eight liters per second is the peak expiratory flow. So fast flow to begin with, air is still leaving because we're still moving up the x-axis. Air is still leaving this person's lips, but it is leaving at a much slower rate. So big deep breath in and then <sighs> struggling to get the last bit out. Uh, and, it out and then breathe in hard and as fast as you can <sighs> to fill the lungs. <clears throat> so what this means is that when you cannot blow out any more, we've reached residual volume. Which means that this from here to here is the force file capacity. Now you'll notice that FEV1 isn't marked on this graph and that's because we don't have anywhere on this graph full time. However, as this is all done through computer, the computer knows how long everything is taken and it will plot it for you. So let's just recap on what we've been talking about. So the Y axis is flow and the x-axis is volume. So you read total lung capacity off the x-axis, and it's this. So what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six liters. That's this person's total lung capacity. The force vital capacity is therefore, oh sorry, hang on, six liters. Therefore, the force vital capacity is the total lung capacity minus the residual lung volume. In other words, six minus two, four liters. Peak expiratory flow is the highest point on the y-axis there, i.e. eight liters per second. You'll notice the residual lung volume is not, is not measured, but it is estimated. Uh, we would need, as I already said, a volume time graph to plot the forced expiratory volume in one second. So typically, you will either get the both graphs plotted at the same time, or the computer will just plot FEV1 for you and it will say exactly where it is. So what we tend to get is a spirometry output like this. Okay, so this bit here is your total lung capacity. This bit here is a good idea. There's your residual lung volume. And we'll notice that we've got forced expiratory volume in one second there. And you'll notice that this time the forced expiratory volume in one second has been plotted on our uh, flow volume loop for us. So what we're looking at on this one is we're looking at a normal spirogram, a normal spirogram versus a spirogram of somebody in the blue with an obstructive lung disease. So what when we think about somebody with an obstructive lung disease, we tend to think of somebody who's um, got a barrel chest. In other words, their lung volumes are bigger because their chest is bigger. So this is where you start to think to yourself, well, hang on a minute, Lou. What's going on here? Because peak flow is reduced, but also vital capacity is reduced but vital capacity isn't actually telling us about the total lung capacity ha huh. so look at this the other thing that gets reduced with people with obstructive lung diseases sorry not reduced increased is the residual lung volume so what we find with people with obstructive lung diseases is that their whole graph shifts 
to the left. So total lung volume increases compared to a normal person, but also the residual lung volume increases compared to a normal person. And this is not something that you get off your volume time graph. But what we also see with somebody with an obstructive lung problem is we see a markedly reduced peak flow. We see a markedly reduced peak flow. We see the slope of this curve is not as steep. But we also see a massively reduced forced expiratory volume in one second compared to a normal person. Vital capacity in other words, the difference between here and here versus here and here is also reduced. So why is this? Well, obstructive lung problems, the easy way to remember this is that you can't get A out. So an obstructive is out. Starts with O, starts with O. Obstructive lung disease, can't. you have problems getting A out. So you can get A in, but then you have problems getting it out. This is what gives us that barrel chested appearance that people with obstructive lung diseases have. They, they appear to be what's called hyperinflated because they got a lot of air in there. So what we get because we have problems getting air out is you get a decreased peak expiratory flow. And because it's harder to get air out, you end up leaving more air in the lungs. So the residual lung volume is increased. Potentially, increase total lung capacity and because we have get we have trouble getting this air out we get <laughs> we get a a decent increase in flow rate at the start but then that tails off as we start to struggle to get the air out so when you look at this flow volume curve we get what's called a coving or a caving in of the spirogram breathing in the shape can sometimes look quite normal but you will often find the inspiratory curve the area under the curve is reduced so you're not taking as much air in because you have a reduced respiratory lung volume to begin with so when you find the forced expiratory volume in one second and plot it against the total vital capacity, you will find that this person has a forced expiratory ratio of less, um, less than 0 0.75, probably 0 0.7 or below. So that's your obstructive lung diseases. In terms of what I'm going to be expecting you to be able to recognize on all of this stuff, um, if I show you a spirogram as part of the assessment of this, I will expect you to be able to tell me from the spirogram whether you think this person has got an obstructive lung disease or a restrictive lung disease. So restrictive lung disease you have trouble getting air in. And the way you remember this is a restrictive lung disease, disease pushes the curve to the right. So with a restrictive lung disease, you typically get, again, a decreased peak expiratory flow. Why do you get a decreased exper peak expiratory flow? Because you got less air in there to begin with. Therefore, a reduced pressure. Therefore, reduced flow. Decreased residual lung volume, you've got less air left in there because you've taken less air in to begin with. You get decreased total lung capacity, but you get a normal shape to the restrictive curve. So if you look at it, it looks like just a little mini version of a normal curve. So everything else tends to be quite normal. So inspiration is decreased, and therefore all volumes and capacities are decreased, but you get a normal forced expiratory ratio. So the way to remember it is that restrictive moves the curve to the right and it restricts your lungs from filling. So with a restrictive one, everything is reduced, but 
all the volumes are slightly smaller. So look, if you plot it on a volume time graph, the forced expiratory ratio, in other words, how much you get out, your slope is uh, just a little bit changed, but how much you get out in one second in terms of the um, ratio is usually normal. So FEV1, force vital capacity, they're reduced. The ratio remains unchanged. Functional residual capacity, residual lung volume, and total lung capacity all get reduced. With obstructive disease, your forced expiratory volume in one second, functional residual capacity, and the ratio are all reduced. The functional residual capacity, uh, restrict, uh, residual lung volume, and total lung capacity can all be normal or actually can be increased. So with functional residual capacity, it can go either way with obstructive diseases. Okay. Now, I don't like this curve on this graph. So I've just put this one in just to remind you, okay, that with uh, an obstructive lung disease, the vital capacity will may be normal or may just be reduced ever so slightly. But the key is how much you can get out in one second is the big difference. So that's my 30 minute tour de force of what we're looking for on these graphs. Um, keep your eyes peeled because as soon as we've started case three, I'm going to put up um, some sample questions of the kind of things that I might be asking you to figure out as part of your assessment on spirometry.